Hello everyone. Today we're going to uh, continue our discussion on art history. So we started somewhere around uh, anywhere depending on the dating methods from around 165,000 years back uh, to uh, maybe 120,000 years ago uh, somewhere around the dawn of humanity we spoke about how uh, art is just something that shows up at the same time humans do modern humans like you and I and how it's a fundamental it's fundamentally human okay and so we spoke about that we, sh we viewed the kind of art they were making then we viewed the kind of art they were making in ancient civilizations um, uh, with registers and things like that and we've worked our way all the way through all these classical art movements the Renaissance um, all the way into beginning modern art and here we find ourselves uh, looking at the Impressionists who were bold in their use of color uh, they were bold in letting their brush strokes show so from there we went to the post Impressionists who added their own perspective and and added uh, flat and graphic looks to their uh, picture plane that was heavily influenced by uh, prints from the East. And we went from that movement to Cubism, where they started really trying to distort uh, time and space and all of these, uh, giving all of these multiple views of an object, trying to give a complete view of an object, all in, compressed into one view. Um, after that, we go to Dada, where people are starting to feel a little existential, and um, the war has caused them to feel like life doesn't have an overarching meaning, and that everything is kind of purposeless and meaningless and random, and so they make art to try and reflect that. Then we shift gears completely opposite of that to uh, trying to find extra meaning uh, in the subconscious. So we go to surrealism where we're trying to figure out and discover uh, things about ourselves and about humanity that no one's ever figured out before, uh, trying to tap into our subconscious and, and display these findings to the rest of the world. And now we're going to deal with the completely abstract. So we already have some explanation of the abstract. We've talked about it when we went ahead and did our project on diving corn. So if you remember, we made some abstract paintings uh, in the beginning of the year or towards the middle maybe of the school year. And we talked about abstract as being uh, things that exist maybe only in your mind or things that don't need concrete representation uh, to exist. So maybe 2 plus 2 is 4. Um, that can exist solely in your mind. I don't need an example of two things coming together with two other things to understand what 2 plus 2 is, that it is 4. I can just know that, and it can exist solely inside my mind. I can think of things that don't exist in my head, and they exist only in that state. Uh, I can think of good and evil, these very abstract concepts, and I don't need some evil perpetrated before me bef for me to know what evil is. Um, I can understand that in my mind. And so we're going to take that concept of abstract and we're going to apply it to art and we're going to learn about the abstract expressionists. So if abstract thought and abstract entities are these things that don't need a concrete existence uh, to exist, then abstract art is art where artists are trying to express themselves without these concrete examples. So what the abstract expressionists were trying to do was to express things like thoughts, uh, ideas, feelings, uh, emotions, their state of being, uh, all without using these concrete examples that we referenced earlier. Uh, so if they're going to tell you about sadness, they're not going to paint a face frowning and crying, right? 
they're trying to reach you on some higher level. Okay, so this starts uh, in America in the 1940s, this particular abstract movement. And this is uh, post-World War II, of course. And uh, one of the notable features of this movement is that for the first time, arguably the first time, uh, the avant-garde cutting-edge art is being made here in America. Okay, so all the other movements that we've spoken of have all been European, if you haven't noticed. So all of the cutting-edge art has always been in Europe somewhere. Well, now the center of the art world has moved to New York, to America, and arguably you could probably make a pretty strong case that it, that it has stayed here ever since. Okay, so I might just be uh, biased and patriotic. Uh, but there is a lot of cutting-edge art being made in America from this point forward. So our first artist that we're going to talk about is Jackson Pollock. So love him, hate him, he's responsible for paintings like these. So that's Pollock there in the top left-hand corner. And then right beside him is one of his famous paintings. So I'm going to try to lay the foundation for you so that you can understand these paintings and hopefully have an appreciation for them yourself. So these paintings are meant to be pure expression. So this should be easy for you to remember because we talked about what abstraction is and these are definitely abstract. There are no objective objects in here that we can appeal to. Um, and they're very, very expressive. So this painting is made completely of expressive marks. So there are different sides of the fence that you can land on when it comes to these abstract paintings by Jackson Pollock. And I think the people that aren't very familiar with art, uh, they don't understand it, they don't have a f very firm grasp uh, on fine art, they would probably look at these paintings and say, it looks like a little kid did it, or anybody could do that. Uh, looking at these very expressive marks and seeing no talent required to make these. For a time, when I first started college and the first time I saw these, I don't know that I would say I, I landed in that camp, uh, but I definitely could sympathize with it. These did look kind of silly in a way, and I was learning the fundamentals of how to render and how to make things look naturalistic or as you might say realistic and uh, it was not an easy task and so I didn't understand these at first but uh, I have to say my opinion changed when I went and saw one of these in person. So the very first time I experienced one of these paintings was in the Houston Museum of Art. They had some of these on display and I looked at this painting and when you view it the way you're supposed to you get up close to these they're a depth of field painting so you're supposed to view them up close so that all you can see is painting so you lose all frame of reference with everything around you and you become completely immersed in the painting so these are very large paintings and we'll talk about why in a minute so these are large paintings and you get up close enough to them that all you can see is painting and when you do this, you see that these little strings everywhere actually end up creating a very shallow space. These paintings start to create an optical illusion where they start to look like they're almost about a foot deep. So where a landscape painting, if you play the optical illusion right, they look like they're miles deep. These paintings have a very shallow space. So each little line, the white lines might look like they're in front of the black lines and the black lines look like they're just under that, and then some of these earthy yellows might be below that, and then some of the those uh, muted greens might be further than that. And so every layer of lines looks like it's several inches above the next line. And so you end up getting this really bizarre space of these tangled expressive webs, and it's actually just an amazing uh, experience. And so that changed my mind about Pollock, and I wanted to find out more about him. So at this point, I hadn't had enough art history to actually know what these paintings were about, but I made it my point to go and figure it out after seeing these. So these paintings do not do them justice. If you ever get a chance to go to the museum uh, and see some of these, I highly recommend it. And you guys all live right here in Dallas. 
uh, you're in a good position to have an opportunity to see some of this. Now, how did he make these? This is really important. So the way he did this was uh, he actually dribbled paint. So a lot of people think he splashed paint uh, on the on the surface of his uh, of his paintings, but he would actually lay down these giant sheets of wood on the floor of his studio. And I, I'm I'm saying these sheets were sometimes 10 by 10, 15 by 15, and he would walk on top of them dribbling paint. And the reason this process is important is it goes back to this idea of being completely expressive. Now, we talked about signatures in the beginning of the year, and the way you move, something about you dictates that. Uh, so whenever you write your signature, your signature expresses something about you that no one else quite mirrors. And that's why your signature is so valuable for proving that you are who you say you are. There's something unique about you and the way you move and the way you write and the style you like to write in. So it's very expressive. Well, these paintings, think of them as one giant signature. Okay, so every movement Jackson Pollock decides to make, everywhere he turns, every movement of his hand, every, every movement it occurs to him to make is recorded on these paintings. And so these paintings are like a reflection of the artist making them. And they're very expressive. Any color he chooses to paint, any movement he chooses to make, it's all just recorded. So this is just himself being recorded out in real time whenever he's making these paintings. And so it's a really beautiful idea and it makes for some very interesting paintings. So with that being said, at this point we know that these are big paintings. They're highly expressive. They're meant to record something fundamental about the person and what they're feeling and, and who they are. And I think they do a pretty good job of that. Now, the reason they're big is because they are roughly the size of a person usually, depending on the artist. And the idea behind that is that these are metaphors for people, right? So this is a reflection of Pollock, so they're going to be about the size of a person, okay? So now we have this metaphor that directly ties all these ideas together. So we're going to go into our next artist, Clifford Steele. These are some of his works, also part of the Abstract Expressionist movement, but as you can see, completely different than Jackson Pollock's style because he's a different person. His abstract work is going to be dramatically different than Pollock's. All these artists' work is going to be significantly different. So Clifford Steele's paintings almost look like, almost look like tears or, or something like that. I've heard it described. It looks like layers are being peeled off. To me, I see them as forests. So I see this large mass over here to the left, that really strong, contrasty black mass there. It, to me, it looks like a forest. And then the, uh, the orangish reds and, and all those muted reds, they look like the sky to me. So to me, these, everything looks like a landscape to me because I'm a landscape painter. But they're really phenomenal works. And one thing you have to know about these is they are excessively large. So I'm not really sure why. But some of these paintings are 15, 20 feet tall. Something around that. I've seen them in Houston before. And they're really phenomenal pieces. And they're surprisingly large. So uh, I saw them in history books. That's the only time I've ever seen them up until the point where I've gone to these museums in Houston and saw them in person. They're well worth the visit, and I was very surprised to see what scale they were in in real life. Our next artist is Willem de Kooning, very famous artist, very successful abstract expressionist. This painting here is his most famous work. To be honest, uh, it's probably my least favorite work that he did. De Kooning is kind of hit and miss with me, and that is uh, just my personal taste. It doesn't mean that I'm right and he's wrong or, or that there's something wrong with de Kooning. Uh, but that's my own personal opinion. And this one is one of the ones I, I don't really care for. I think the face is kind of fun. But as far as the idea, I think having this figure smack in the middle of an abstract painting uh, it just doesn't do it any favors, in my opinion. And two, it, it's very ketchup and mustard. Uh, a lot of red, a lot of mustard. 
Uh, and when I see those combinations like that in abundance, uh, I just can't help but think uh, messy hot dog plate. So that could be something personal to me. Now this next painting, this next to Kooning, it's really nice. This is an example of one that I would actually appreciate. I really like these forms. Now, one of the things about de Kooning, you saw a whole figure in the painting before. Well, de Kooning, a lot of times body parts seem to slip into his paintings. And so up here in the uh, top, or about the center uh, top, maybe slightly to the left, it looks almost like a closed eye. You almost have eyelids. And, you know, a lot of times you can find mouths and things like that in his paintings. So that, you know, that comes out, I don't know if he does it on purpose or if it's kind of like a Freudian slip and he, it, it's just kind of something that he focuses on. And so that kind of comes out in his paintings accidentally, um, kind of like the surrealists. You know, I'm going to say I really appreciate his sculptural work. Once again, I might be biased. I'm a sculptor. I love uh, sculpture. But to me, this is where his greatest work is. Uh, this is a really phenomenal piece. Uh, this next one here, it almost looks like three-dimensional graffiti almost. You have some of the planes look kind of geometric, some look organic, and so you have this really nice mixture and this contrast. But it, you wouldn't be surprised to see this thing carved up into letters and being blasted on some wall somewhere. It has those kind of elements to it, especially this one right here, this next one. And this one right here, you can actually go see. It's right here in Dallas. So the Nasher Sculpture Museum is a museum dedicated to sculpture in the Dallas area. I believe the first weekend of every month is free. You can walk right in here and go look at everything in the museum. So it's a wonderful benefit of the people that actually live in this area. So go check it out. You can actually go see a real de Kooning, and it's a really nice one. And once again, it has almost that kind of aesthetic that we appreciate here in these regions. So. Next, we have Arshal Gorky. And so this quote here says, abstraction allows man to see with his mind what he cannot physically see with his eyes. So he's commenting on this nature of abstraction and abstract ideas. And I feel like this is a really important concept for you to understand because we live in a world that's dominated by a materialistic thought. But there are these things that are very immaterial. So all these things like abstraction that exist in our mind, where are they? Can we measure them? Where is the particle for the imagination? Can we, can we tell where they're at or how much it weighs or, you know? So it's this really interesting thing that kind of defies naturalism. He goes on to say abstract art enables the artist to perceive beyond the tangible, to extract the uh, infinite out of the finite. You know, it's kind of like a comment about how your imagination is limitless, and we're tapping into that as abstract expressionists, or as artists in general. And he goes on to say it's the emancipation of the mind. In other words, it, it frees you. And he's excited about how we're discovering these new things. So it's a, in a lot of ways, it's like surrealism. You're exploring things about yourself that you might not even know. So you might be surprised at what comes out. Now, here's one of his paintings over here to the right. To me, his paintings almost look a lot like flower forms and still life. So a lot of these could be made out to be flowers. Uh, this one right here is another one that I really like. And I'm going to go ahead and ruin it for you because I ruined it for myself. Now, remember, these things aren't supposed to have recognizable objects in it. They're not supposed to be objective. They're, they're supposed to be completely subjective, non-objective, right? So this is just him painting how he feels. And there's not supposed to be these concrete examples. But right smack dab in the middle here, you have that yellow shape. It looks just like a dog head to me. And above the yellow, you have like these, these eyes and what looks like red eyelids above them. And then on the end of the yellow snout, you have a red nose. So it almost looks a lot like Pluto to me. And I cannot unsee it, no matter how much I try. So every time I look at this painting now, I see that dog head. And then finally, we're going to talk about my favorite artist out of all of these, Mark Rothko. And these are his works over here to the right. Probably one of the artists that you would be the most tempted to look at and say that he's a talentless hack. Anybody could paint this. He's just painting stupid squares, right? So that's what it looks like. This is a phenomenal piece. 
One thing about Rothko, his sense of color is absolutely phenomenal. These color combinations are wonderful. We'll look at another one here. Uh, really nice work. Now, I get a lot from a lot of students usually that they can do this. There's nothing to it. And so I've actually made a bargain with a few students before that if they could make a Rothko that had the same effect of a Rothko, that I would let them, I would give them a 100 for the six weeks, no matter what else they turned in. And uh, every time, no fail, they've always given up and said it was too hard. So it's a lot more difficult than it looks. There's a lot more to it. And for one thing, when you actually go up to these, because of the color choices and because of the handling of the brush, you go up to these just like you do the Pollock. They're depth of field paintings. You get up close to them to where all you can see is painting. And when you do that, because of those handling of the brush and because of those color choices, these squares begin to start looking like they're levitating above the surface of the painting. It's a phenomenal experience, really wonderful. Once again, these look like landscapes to me. So you can definitely see these horizon lines in a lot of these to where one square might look like the land and one square might look like the sky. Or sometimes there's a third one. You might say there's land, a coastline, and then you might say one of them might be the ocean or the body of water. And then the next one is the sky. So like I said, I'm a landscape artist, and once again, I might be biased. Now, at some point, Rothko, Mark Rothko, built what he called the Rothko Chapel. And uh, it's filled with his depth of field paintings, or what they would call field of vision paintings. And he tried to create a religious experience without religion. So that was his idea. So he made this chapel that you could come in here and you could do your thing no matter what religion you were. But his ultimate goal was to be like the great masters that painted all these religious paintings that give you this amazing feeling that, you know, these people that were honored and revered and their work has been enjoyed and uh, basically oohed and awed over for uh, centuries. And he wanted to create that kind of experience, but take the religious part out of the paintings and see if he could just do it with his skill, if he could make you feel the same way. You know, I think what he was trying to do was largely impossible, and he didn't feel like he, he succeeded, and so he actually ended up committing suicide, which is really kind of sad. Uh, he felt like he failed, he was a failure, and he ended up ending his own life, which I think he did about as good as anyone can do in this respect. These paintings are absolutely phenomenal, and this is a really cool experience. If you ever get to check this out, do it. It's in Houston, Texas. It's well worth it. And within walking distance, you have several really amazing art museums. You have the Houston Contemporary. You have the Houston Museum of Art. You have, from walking distance from the Rothko Chapel, you also have the Manil. It's a gigantic privately owned collection where these wealthy heirs to the oil industry bought a gigantic collection of art, and instead of just keeping it all to themselves, they decided to build a giant museum for it and allow everyone in to see it for free. So, uh, and, and there's some stuff in there that you've only seen in art history books or online. Really phenomenal works. I mean, you have Picassos, you have Rothkos, you have, I mean, you name it, it just about it's there. Really amazing work. And this place is also free, the Rothko Chapel. And like I said, it's an experience worth having. You go up there, and just to kind of give you a frame of reference for this picture here, these benches here are a lot bigger than they look. So you could probably easily fit seven people across these benches, if I recall right. They were really big. And so that'll give you some frame of reference to see how big these paintings are. These are massive paintings. And once again, you get up as close to them as you feel comfortable, <laughs> and as they allow, basically up you go up to the little rail where they don't let you go any closer, and you look at these paintings, and once again, this looks like some of the biggest garbage you could ever find because these paintings are basically solid colors. So uh, the violet one over there, the really big violet one over to the right side, it's full of subtleties. So when you go up there, you notice that it's a gigantic violet painting, dark, 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 dark violet, or purple, as you might say. 
in Texas. It's purple. So you get to this large purple painting, and then you see that it's composed entirely of violet, a little bit lighter violet, a little bit darker violet, and maybe a little bit darker violet. So it's very, very subtle differences. So this entire painting is covered in these little subtle differences in brush strokes. And what you do is you just focus on these subtleties. And I tell you, it's a really meditative and beautiful experience. Uh, you end up just really getting into this real daydreamy state. And uh, they're really wonderful to enjoy. Just focusing on subtleties for a while. And just really makes you appreciate the detail in life. And, you know, it's a great way to kind of feel how artists feel when they've been painting for hours. So I would express that. And that's how I would describe it. Painters, a lot of times, once they've been painting for a while, they get something called painter's brain, where they shift fully into that creative mode. And it's a really cool experience. So definitely check it out. Like I said, I think he did as good with his goal as a human possibly could. But in the end, he didn't feel like he succeeded. And uh, he ended up committing suicide. And I think if you notice what else, Van Gogh committed suicide. It seems like that happens a lot. Jackson Pollock that we talked about earlier, he didn't commit suicide, but he did end up living a very miserable life. I don't think he was very happy or very satisfied either. And uh, he ended up being very reckless. So I'm just going to throw this in there. He was he thought of himself as kind of like a, a cowboy, like a macho man. And he would uh, end up cutting up and acting out. At one point, he's at a very wealthy gallery owner's house, uh, very prominent in the art world, has been promoting his art and helping him to be famous. And at one of these parties at her house, let's say he became inebriated and he ended up, instead of going to the restroom to use the restroom, he ended up urinating in that person's fireplace. So a real wild person, real crazy, destructive person. He ended up dying in a drinking and driving accident. I think a lot of these artists are people who are never satisfied. And I think that's why they go down in history. And that's why we appreciate their work. And why it's so amazing is because successful people tend to look at their work with more scrutiny. So instead of looking at every single thing you do and think, oh, this is the most amazing thing I could have ever done. Oh, I'm just amazing. Instead, look at it how other people might look at it and, and see the flaws in it. And, and don't be so satisfied with yourself right away. Try to figure out what, what could be better. And, you know, you know, I'm not saying be such a perfectionist that you end up hurting yourself like these people. But... You definitely, you know, to be successful, I think you have to be able to look at your own work, look at yourself, and be able to scrutinize yourself. But then don't just stop there. Don't just say, oh, everything I do is trash. Do something about it. So figure out how to make it better. Okay? And so I think that's the real takeaway message here with abstract expressionism and with a lot of these artists up to this point that terminated their lives prematurely or lived really uh, hostile uh, lifestyles to themselves and maybe even to other people as well. They could have, I'm not saying do that, but I'm just saying the takeaway message is, you know, look at what you're doing with more scrutiny. Uh, and that's what it takes, I think, to be successful. So that wraps up this lesson. Uh, we have, I think, two more art history lessons and we're almost to the end of the school year. So hang in there. Uh, we just have a little bit left to persevere through. And then we get an, a nice long break. And so everybody take care of yourselves. Stay safe. Uh, try not to go crazy. Be all locked up. I'll see you uh, in the next video. Um, if you have any questions, make sure you send me an email or leave me a comment. Bye.